Dr. Reel, you can uh, start the session. Okay. Please introduce yourself because uh, we are coming after a break. So it would be good mm -hmm. if you introduce yourself and start off with the presentation. Yes, uh, just to confirm, you can see my screen, right? Yes, we can see your screen. Oh, that's good. Um, okay, let's start this uh, new session. Um, my name is Adil Razi. Um, I'm currently based in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I work at Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health, um, which is a part of the Faculty of Madison, uh, and I'm at Monash University. Um, so I think I have been told that this session participants are mostly chemists and biologists with, uh, with some uh, computer scientists and probably some engineers, but uh, yeah, uh, more people in natural sciences. So that's a sort of a, um, I usually talk to uh, audience, which is uh, more in uh, neurology or clinicians or um, neuroscientists, engineers, mathematicians, but less with chemistry and biologists, the chemists and biologists. So let's see how it goes. Um, just to introduce a bit, uh, we have an hour, uh, I'll try to, introduce what I would want to uh, talk about. Um, and just to introduce you uh, to, uh, as an introduction of myself, uh, I'm originally from Karachi. Uh, I did my bachelor's in electrical engineering from NED University uh, a while back, 19, years ago. Um, and then I did my master's in communications engineering from Germany. And then I did my uh, PhD in wireless communications um, in, still in electrical engineering from University of New South Wales in Sydney. Then I spent about six months in industry uh, developing uh, wireless LAN chips for a, a big, uh, multinational Broadcom Corporation. Um, but then towards the end of my PhD and, and um, while I was working at Broadcom, um, I wanted to do something else while I was earning quite a lot and um, I was kind of settled. I wanted to do something else. And um, I brain and neuroscience seems to me something which piqued my interest and, uh, and I made a, a jump. So I moved from wireless communications or mobile networks to a world of brain networks. Um, and this is uh, since 2012. So I did my PhD in 2012. And then I spent six, six years at University College London at Wellcome Trust Center for Neuroimaging um, and I spent six months around in 2012, I moved to um, Munesh to open my um, independent uh, lab. Uh, I'm based, as I said, uh, at the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health. And I'm also, uh, the physical location where I sit is called Munesh Biomedical Imaging. And this is where we have uh, all these different toys or, or expensive machines called MRI. We have a uh, a uh, three Tesla MRI here, and we also have a very unique simultaneous MR PET scanner. There are only three or four in, uh, around the world, so lucky to have it. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today, um, I will try to keep it very high level, um, and I will try not to go, uh, because I'm expecting that what I'm going to um, introduce you to today's for many of you it some of it or you know at least large part of the material that I'm going to discuss it is going to be new so I will try not to go in a lot of details um, and that we can do uh, in another session maybe when I am physically uh, in Pakistan in Islamabad 
in Karachi or Lahore, wherever we have that in the next workshop. Um, but what I'll try to do is to get you going with just to introduce some of the concepts and some of the things that we are doing. Um, there would be some mathematics there uh, because that's what I do. Uh, but I will try not to go into detail and don't get distracted by equations and all that. And I'll try to minimize as much as possible, but there would be some, but don't get scared. So, um, uh, we, uh, so we will uh, keep it, try to keep it simple. Okay, let's um, start. So what I do is computational neuroscience. Um, okay, so let's see if I might, okay. So what we do is basically at the interface of life sciences and physical or engineering sciences. So that's an interface. I'm electrical engineer, and I'm trying to understand how the brain works. And inevitably, that's a life sciences problem. Um, so that's the multidisciplinarity of our uh, work, uh, highly multidisciplinary. Uh, in my lab, for example, we have people who are mathematicians who have the bachelors in maths or physics and but there are others who have the who are doctors and clinicians they are psychologists and, and philosophers and all that so it's a very very uh multidisciplinary uh environment that we have um okay so what we do um we we, we investigate models and dynamics of brain networks and what does it mean this is what i'll try to introduce you during the session. Uh, so the important key course, the key concepts here are models and dynamics and networks. We will do some instance on, the, on, on them. Um, this is where we will talk about machine learning. Okay, and then uh, what do we, how do we measure what's happening? Because the main uh, organ, or the main system or the main physical system that we're gonna try to understand, as I said, it is brain. So how do we actually measure what's happening in the brain? And that's what we're gonna do with using imaging or neuroimaging or brain imaging techniques. I will exclusively focus today on MRI, but we also do quite a bit of work with MEG which is similar to EEG, but more expensive, more fancy. Um, um, we, we use machine learning and the sort of machine learning we use is not very, it, it's, it's very classical machine learning. Uh, we do, uh, I think the next talk is from Shafiq and he will introduce quite a bit on, uh, I'm assuming on deep learning and similar, very powerful, uh, uh, ways to look uh, into uh, the sort of systems. But, um, but here I will try to use more classical machine learning. We combine this with Bayesian inference and then that's a very important tool that we use because Bayesian inference is about quantifying uncertainty. So lots of things that we try to model there's lots of probabilities. There are lots of uncertainty. And Bayesian inference allows us to quantify the uncertainty of a system. We use quite a bit of physics. So physics, because the brain itself, we model this as a dynamical system, a system which has dynamics. So I have, um, oh yeah. So, so, we, so I'll show, uh, we will use, differential equations to model the brain. Uh, you don't need to, again, as I said, we, it seems quite, uh, you know, quite involved. We are going to use quite a few things, but, um, you know, there's a lot of work that, uh, there's a whole breadth of, uh, you know, uh, expertise. There's, every, there's something for everyone, either you're a biologist, chemist, um, or engineer, mathematician, there's, there's, uh, because the, the sort of problems we are trying to deal with, they're pretty big. And we need people from every area to actually understand how the brain works. And I'm not uh, saying that we are going to understand how the brain works anytime soon. 
it is a big problem. Uh, okay, so so that's sort of a in that sort of a setting. Let's talk about what I'm going to to uh, do today. So I will provide a very uh, very basic introduction of what uh, uh, is this area called computational neuroscience is, um, and how do we see? Uh, lots of people when they say computational neuroscience, they mean they may mean very different things. So the sort of lens we want to use uh, to talk about computational neuroscience that I will introduce. Um, the main modalities, the main way that we measure the brain. Uh, responses is using brain imaging. So that's, I'm going to give you very basics of brain imaging. Some of it you will know like MRI basics of structural MRI, but I will, most of my work is about functional MRI because functional MRI is dynamic and we are interested in the dynamics of the brain, how the brain evolves over time when we are doing certain tasks, how the brain implements them over time. And this means they are dynamics. And then I will talk about uh, how different parts of the brain work together, how they are connected with each other. And that's what we're gonna talk about using some um, a, a, a Bayesian framework that we have developed that's called dynamic causal modeling. And then I will also talk about something which is, um, uh, so I'm going to, uh, uh, we are going to talk about, um, uh, a, a very simple uh, principle, this is what we call synergy principle, uh, but it is simple, but it can explain the most complex of phenomena like life. So synergy principle is a unifying principle or theory which tries to explain the existence of life. I will not have again to go into the maths and all that. I will just try to introduce the idea to you and then um, just to, introduce you and then we can maybe at other times we can go into more detail. So there are quite a few things that I want to introduce today. Okay, let's um, start with um, introduction. So uh, let's talk about the brain, which is the, the main focus here. We want to understand brain, right? How does the brain give rise to experience, thought and behavior? So uh, several of you are chemists here and, and biologists here, and you know that if you look at actually the brain, it is made up of uh, these uh, neurons. And these neurons, if you look at them further, they are actually in the end, they're nothing but uh, some chemicals, yeah? Potassium, calcium, um, they are, uh, so in the end, they, they are just some, you know, very uh, basic elements. Uh, but when we, when we have many of them, they interact. Uh, and make network. And from these interaction of these, if you look at a neuron itself, it may be very, very basic element, which is not very much in isolation, but when you have billions of them, they can do wonders. We can, um, as we know the powers of the brain, we can go to the Mars and uh, have, thinking about having colonies there. So that's made possible by the interaction of those very tiny, um, tiny uh, uh, neurons, which in isolation are very insignificant. So I will start with phenology. Phenology is a concept from 17, 18th century where uh, people used to uh, look at the uh, brain and feel it and say that, okay, this part of the brain is doing certain things. For example, um, you know, if, if we, we know that the visual cortex at the back, yeah? Uh, and then there was a, a person who was, uh, there were uh, people who will feel your head and say, okay, this part of the brain seems bigger. This means this person is, is, is more intelligent or it has certain qualities. And, uh, and that's the modular view of the mind, very initial, 17th, 18th century. It was all phenology. It, does, it doesn't have any evidence uh, and it was all wrong. What we know now about the brain, the brain comes, as I said, from the interaction of neurons. Um, and these neurons together, they make a homogeneous set uh, of what we call brain regions. For example, we talk about uh, prefrontal cortex, for example, we talk about um, cortical regions like uh, 
you know, uh, post a single cortex, or, or we talk about visual cortex or auditory cortex. So, so these are also, it seems like we are still giving them some names. Uh, and it seems like, again, seems like a phenology, but visual cortex, now we know that it doesn't only do we, uh, uh, help with vision, but it also helps with other functions as well. So the, the two phrases here that I want to it introduce a functional segregation where, where there's a specific role given to a certain part of the brain that it does that. While the modern view is this, that there's a functional interaction. And, and this is what I'm trying to show here, that this may be a certain part of the brain which has the same color in orange, there's another one in light blue, um, and they interact. And these interactions uh, and these networks or modules, they, they interact, and this gives rise to uh, what we call the intelligence in a sense of consciousness. So functional segregation to functional integration, which is uh, the modern uh, thought about how the consciousness arises from uh, the insignificant neurons. If we, so this is here, what I have is, is Raman Kayul's uh, hand uh, drawn figure. So these are, the columns of neurons, which are which he drew by hand, uh, original work from the comparative study of um, of uh, of sensory areas of the human cortex, published in eighteen ninety nine. So uh, a, a typical brain has about hundred to uh, about hundred billion neurons, and there are each neuron snaps about 10,000 times. So this is actually a 10 raised to power 13 computing element. So if you take a brain, um, you take each neuron and, and you connect them together, there's so much wiring in the brain that you can take this to the moon and come back. So that's the amount of wiring which is packed in our, hand, in, in our head. Yeah, so you can compare it with, with the volume that you may have in a, in a small computer, nothing in comparison. So there's a huge amount of, you know, um, the processing power which is there. Um, so if we, but here what we are saying is this, that if, if the, the brain is so complex that it has, you know, there are trillions of synapses going on, at a given time in the brain, how we are going to understand the system? It seems impossible, right? Uh, to understand such a complex system that how it does certain things that it does, right? So it seems impossible, uh, but we what we can do is this: we can we don't have to look at the at the system um, at a, at its finest scale. What we do is we look at this. Um, at different level of hierarchy. So that new concepts or the concept that I'm going to introduce are of the hierarchies or the scales. So as I said before, they are genes. So these probably you can think of them as a most basic structure. They give us, you know, they are brain cells at another scale uh, or the neurons that together they give you the cyto arc, cyto architecture that I was showing you from the casuals diagrams, hand handwritten diagrams. They together, so this is called micro level, meso, macro, and then you know this is the level of brain regions that and this, they make systems, and this is where we are going to operate, and then behaviors and mental disorders. So this is the whole scale of things and and you can so so you can you can study them at each scale irrespective of what's going on beneath or what's going on at above and you can just look at that system this gives us a way to actually attack the problem so we don't worry about other scales we just look at certain scale and work with that so cellular neuroscientists would work here uh, people like me they work here People like uh, psychiatrists and doctors, they usually work at this level. Um, so uh, you can take this example, those who are from engineering or computer science background. Humans have learned from this, from these hierarchies that you can actually start with simple things and build very complex systems which can, which can do lots of things. So here I'm giving you an example of a of a very simple transistor, 
So this is a um, it is an NPN junction. It, it is basically a CMOS. So, so that's a transistor. Yeah, very small. That's that's the main basic building block of a computing device or, or a mobile device, any computing device, mobile is a computing device as well. So any computing device, uh, the basic cell is, the basic element is a transistor. You can connect these and make what we call an operational amplifier. Yeah, this is the internal circuitry of a of an, of a, of an operational amplifier. Um, then you can use lots of them to make a chipboard and a motherboard. So there is a microprocessor and there are other units and these are single computer. So this is how the mobile or, the, or a motherboard of a computer looks like, right? And then you can come connect these different devices, make systems, right? So, so humans have learned from these and, um, and, and these are basically uh, hierarchies or, or systems at different scales that we have built, inspired by neural systems. Uh, you can then, what I would like to say is this, that you can then uh, look at these systems at various different spatial or temporal scales. So spatial scales, as I was saying, genes at nanometer, very small. The signaling that they do is in picosecond. The signaling or uh, sampling they do is at picoscale, and then uh, neurons and and you know like micrometers, and then brain like uh, brain regions and systems at millimeter, centimeter, or if you look at uh, you know time scale, they're in seconds, and so on and so forth. So, so from brains to humans to societies. Uh, so that's sort of time scale and spatial scales. Uh, you know, and, and, and so as you see that they have all have different clocks, yeah, from pico scale to airs, similar to what a, you know, a wireless system would have. Uh, the transistors would have uh, um, a clock, which is, very fast, right? Nano or because and then it goes, you know, up to the other scales. Okay, so uh, so if I if I now uh, make uh, a, a comparison between the biological system, which is the brain or the neural system, to an artificial neuron. So these days we all know. Uh, the, the wonders that the deep learning and artificial neural networks have uh, have made possible. So if you look at the neural, the artificial neuron is just nothing but something like a, uh, a a certain thing which has an input, which takes several inputs, and it's just nothing but some sort of a nonlinearity like a sigmoid function here, and and you have an output. So single neuron is just nothing. It's very insignificant, yeah? Single artificial neuron. And basically, by the way, you can have this nonlinearity using an operational amplifier that I was showing you on the previous slide. So it's just very basic building block. But once you take this artificial neuron, you can actually build more powerful systems, yeah? For example, I'm showing you this example here from uh, from very early neural networks when they were shallow, when they were not deep. Um, um, okay, so um, so what what I'm trying to show you here is this that uh, you can combine these, you can combine these neurons, and then they can do some useful stuff for you. They can do some. Uh, classification for you, simple classification. Uh, you can then use many of them. You can make many layers and then they can do even more complex problems for you. For example, you can have, you can give it an input of it, you know, uh, and then you, you have, so first layer would look at, uh, identify the edges, the subsequent layer will identify combination of these edges, uh, edges, sorry. And then um, another layer would identify a feature and so on. And then you can say, okay, that's George Washington, right? So, uh, so what we are again trying to say is that's that this is an artificial neural network, which is, which is basically on the same idea that 
ways is insignificant neurons can actually when combined together can do quite complex tasks like this here. Okay, um, but then the point would be that uh, if we want to compare the biological and, and artificial networks. So for example, here I'm showing you um, uh, is, uh, is this that um, uh, here you have a brain where we are doing some measurements. So I'm showing you these brain regions. E each circle is a certain brain region and we can extract activity using MRI or functional MRI that I'll talk about a bit more, uh, quite more detail later on. Uh, so we can use this um, to, uh, to look at the activity, what's happening in this brain region and this brain region and this brain region and so on. So we can have a multivariate activity or multivariate time series there. We can use these features to build some more uh, sophisticated, uh, network like a similarity matrix. And from this, we can create what we call a functional brain network. Now, in we can actually, this is like a measurement. So this is how you are measuring what's happening in the brain using an MRI, for example. I'm giving you an example of an artificial dynamics that I was actually introducing on the previous slide is this that you have a neuron, you have inputs, you have outputs, there's a nonlinearity, there's a, it, once the input goes above certain threshold, you get some output. You can connect this and it gives you uh, an image, image classifier, a dog, and you know, a dog, and it tells you, okay, there's a dog here. So the same concept here. Um, the only thing here is this, that now instead of having an actual, uh, instead of having, an, having a, uh, an artificial neuron, we actually work here now with an actual neuron, yeah? So it has soma, it has a, you know, the nucleus and, and synapses and yeah. So we can actually model what's what a single neuron do for example using uh hodgkin huxley uh, uh model or fits you in a remote. so these are different uh, we don't need to go into the details but there's a lots of physics there so one can one can actually model how, what happens what dynamics happens in a single neuron and then we can connect them and what we call so each node here is a neuron and we can connect them. And this is done by using Vinsel, Wilson Corwin model. So it's very uh, famous sort of a neural mass model. We have multiple neurons and then we can connect them and we can get large scale regional networks of brain networks that we usually work with in systems neuroscience. So the important here is this, that this is modeling, but this modeling is biophysical dynamics. So we have, a biophysical process which we are modeling with artificial neural networks. We, we, we do, we model artificial dynamics, yeah. Uh, the point here, uh, which I'll try to uh, talk about is this that on the previous slide, probably I can go back, is this that uh, these days we see that artificial neural networks or deep learning uh, techniques, they can, uh, they can uh, accomplish quite a lot. Yeah. So one could think that why uh, people are doing this modeling with computational uh, methods and working with actual brains or biological systems, what's the need? Why, why, where does it fit? While the artificial neural networks, which are inspired by the, uh, you know, uh, with those sort of things, um, they are caricature, but they can do quite a lot. So why bother about biophysical dynamics? That's what I do. Yeah. So the, 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 the reason that we bother about that is this that while uh, the deep learning has made a lot of progress, and I'll talk about this a bit, uh, a bit later. So let's look at this. So it has deep neural networks have made a deep uh, learning has made a lot of progress uh, but um, current uh, state of the art is, is that we can only solve those problems which a, a human does unconsciously 
So a doctor which looks at a uh, MRI of a certain tumor, uh, and if it, the doctor is, is experienced, it doesn't take them that much effort. They, he could just look at it and tell you it is X sort of a you know disease or X sort of a tumor or you know it doesn't require him a lot of effort. And this is where and this is where the deep learning is really good because the problem is static. There are finite number of uh, tumors and one can train on them with lots of data and then deep learning can do a really good job and with a bit of a human in the loop, it can basically get near human uh, performance. However, where the deep learning currently fails is a dynamic environment where we have to do conscious effort. For example, um, I am giving this talk and you are trying to understand what I'm trying to say. So there is a, uh, although right now it's a monologue, but in, in a usual discussion, there's a dialogue where someone is saying something, other one, other person is trying to understand, and then they have a conversation back and forth. There's a causal aspect. There's, we, they might be discussing what they want to do during the next holiday or, or on the weekend or whatever. So they're planning or doing some, some sort of a you know, task, which is complex. Uh, and this is where and humans can, can still easily do this, right? Most humans, right? But deep uh, neural networks, they would fail at this, at this time at least, uh, because the environment is dynamic. Things are moving. And there's not enough data that when we are having an exchange, there's not enough data, uh, there's no generalizable model uh, in a sense, which can be trained. So this is where the humans are superior, still superior, um, where they can, uh, they can uh, deal with very dynamic environments. Yeah. Uh, so it means that he, human brains and human uh, uh, in general, uh, they have systems which are much more powerful, uh, which we are not yet able to understand. And this is where uh, understanding uh, biological intelligence, the mechanisms is important. And that's why this is probably the biggest frontier for the science to, uh, to you know, invest resources in, understanding biological intelligence, the mechanisms, and, and then we can probably create machines with near biological consciousness or near biological uh, intelligence, whatever that, may, that would mean. Um, so um, just quickly inverse uh, pyramid of innovation in AI. So uh, basically what I'm saying is this, that most Deep learning has done quite a lot. Uh, one, can, one can solve a you know natural language processing uh, sort of thing, passing text classification. Very much is is in the grasp. Computer vision, huge gains. Yeah, they have turned into industrial applications, or the, like uh, uh, autonomous cars and and so on. Uh, but and there's a lot of activity in those areas but there's very little which is done here in the theory, yeah? And this theory is where the next uh, breakthroughs will come from, and most probably by understanding how biological intelligence works, so that we can, so most, uh, I think 95 or 90, yeah, a very large percentage of effort is here, while there's very little being done here in theory. And this is where the basic sciences comes, uh, they are long shot blue sky research, but they can, they have the potential to change what happens here. Yeah. Okay. So, so we should bother about biological intelligence because the artificial intelligence we have currently is not enough. Yeah. To do, uh, to, to, to solve serious problems. Okay. So, um, if we, if we uh, now I um, I'll just try to do a bit of uh, basics of brain imaging to introduce you um, so to so introduce you to the to the sort of uh, uh, what does it mean brain imaging and what how do we actually measure what's happening inside the brain if we are to understand the brain we need to understand 
well, you know, how the brain works, uh, how the brain uh, processes information. And for that, we need to measure what's happening inside the brain, right? So uh, the processes and, and how it implements things. We need to understand that. And for this, we need to do imaging. So this is uh, uh, this is um, an, a very old sort of an MRI scanner from from uh, nineteen from the nineteenth century. So uh, in Mosso's experiment, the subject to be observed lay on a delicately balanced table, which could tip toward either at the head or at the foot. If the weight of either end were increased and so so what what is this happening is that they have a very delicately balanced table and person is laying straight and once this person is uh get in uh, is, is doing some mental work what happens is this that there's more blood that flows into the brain right because when you are doing uh, mental work, you are actually consuming a lot of energy. And that energy is actually, your brain is using from, extracting this energy from, through metabolism, you know, uh, from the blood, right? So there would be a more blood flow. And then if there's a more blood flow that this will slightly, then they'll try to measure that, yeah? So this is how the olden days MRI scanners look like. And now uh, the modern day MRI scanners are like this. They are huge magnets, which require huge, uh, there, there is a, here, there's a, uh, these are, this is a large three Tesla magnet, which requires a lot of cooling. So there's a helium gas, which is circulating to cool that. So that's why it's so big. Uh, the, because the cooling system and the itself the magnet is big. The person lies here, and what we are doing here is doing the same thing that uh, we knew in 19th century, that when person is doing some mental effort, they are uh, basically the, 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 the blood and the motor metabolism in the blood is sort of a proxy for the neural activity. So they, if there's more neural activity, there's more blood flowing and, and more extraction from the blood of oxygen. Uh, and that's why uh, the signal that we measure with an MRI in the brain is called blood oxygen level detection uh, or blood oxygen level uh, system, bold signal. It's called BOLD, bold. Okay. So, just to give you an example of MRI, there are two main kind of MRIs. One is called a structural MRI. This is uh, an, a structural scan of Simpson, uh, which is used to study the anatomy of the brain. So it's, it's the structural MRI, you can think of it as a single image, which is high, high resolution, because the structure is not going to change. It's not dynamic, right? It just remains there. How your brain looks like today would be exactly the same, um, probably in six months uh, time. If brain structure changes, but the changes are uh, at the level of ears to, you know, uh, uh, you know so, so, so the scale of change in the structure of the brain is very slow. While the functional MRI, you can think of it as taking a many, many pictures of a brain. So when functional MRI, what we do, do is this, that we take, many uh, snapshots of brain, which are low resolution, but because uh, we are trying to map the function of the brain, what we are thinking, thinking of sleep or whatever. So here the actual MRI or uh, scans here. So a structural MRI is this very high resolution, single image, yeah, and you can then see uh, you know, lots of lots of structures. The cerebellum here. This is, of course, the, the cortex. Um, you know, and then we have other structures: the brain stem, modula, midbrain. There are some subcortical regions here. The thalamus. Uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, hippocampus and hippocampus where we have the memories and all that. So there are different, three different. Um, uh, this is the uh, how the brain would look like from the side how it looks like from, uh, I think uh, this is from uh, uh, cross-sectionally from 
um, uh, from above, and and uh, this is how it would look like from the uh, from the front. Um, colonel sagittal and uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, and we, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, and then here you have um, functional MRI. As I said, this is a single very high resolution image. Functional MRI is multiple images taken at certain sampling frequency. So you take an image, then you take another image, you take another image, but these images are 3D, not 2D, although we are showing them in 2D here because brain is a 3D, 3D structure. Uh, so it's like they, making a movie, right? Uh, these, uh, the, uh, so one image is taken after another and usually it's about a couple of seconds. The TR, the repetition time between uh, this one image, so usually it's it's up in seconds. The that sort of dynamics that you can actually measure. This is your, sort of a tempo the scale that you uh, can have the signal from fMRI, which is around in seconds. There are other modalities that we are not talking about, like EEG or MEG, and they are much faster in time. They have millisecond uh, uh, temporal resolution, but they don't have this spatial resolution. The good thing about MRI is this, that you can actually access those regions which are deep in the brain. Let's say the subcortex or really things which are here. Uh, with EEG, for example, you can only uh, measure the electrical activity at the at the very top at the skull, while with MRI and that's why it's so uh, popular is this that the fun with functional MRI you can actually measure the changes in the blood flow very deep in the brain with high so it has high spatial resolution but very slow signal. Okay, so that's uh, uh, how you know the functional MRI images look like they're low resolution. Um, so this is uh, again uh, looking at the brain, different pictures of the brain. For example, in this case, uh, there is uh, some these orange areas are showing where there's more activity. So, so it's more like a visual back of the brain uh, area where uh, someone is 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 in the scanner and they are doing some visual tasks. They have been shown a movie or they are doing uh, they are tending to, to some visual stimuli, and then you have the activity in this area. So what do we do is this, that, and this is, you know, usually these days when uh, the different um, um, sort of uh, things are uh, reported in news uh, about neuroscience, they, use, they usually show these heat maps, uh, and they are basically mostly functional MRI. So um, what we are saying here is this, that one can look at the aggregate activity across these uh, and, and one can then, uh, for example, this is what I call statistics. We can do some statistics on them, uh, how different uh, voxels are uh, activated. And this is done by using statistical parametric mapping. And this is a software which uh, I have co-developed with people in UCL. And this is uh, one of the most widely used uh, uh, software in the world, uh, almost. Uh, yeah, um, anywhere where people are doing functional MRI, they are either using the same software called SPM, which is developed at UCL, or they are using some uh, some other implementation, which is some variant of SPM. SPM is the uh, which was developed by by my supervisor Carl Fristen at UCL in mid nineties, and then I have, and many others have worked together with him to uh, to uh, uh, to improve that. Uh, so, uh, and, and this can give you some sort of, and show uh, you the activity in the brain. Uh, orange means uh, more activity, blue means less activity and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, brain imaging, for example, here uh, you can see this is structural image and person having with a schizophrenic patient, they have a um, ventricle enlargement. So you can see there's a vent ventricles and they are enlarged when the when, when person has schizophrenia. Uh, if you're lying, for example, you're playing uh, uh, you're playing cards and you're lying, then you will have an activity in areas called anterior cingulate cortex or left prefrontal cortex. So that's the usual pattern when you lie. Uh, so what I will be talking about is uh, is structure is networks at 
at, at larger scale, large scale networks. Um, so brain has these large scale networks, uh, for example, default mode network. So I don't know how many, you know, default mode network is very important network in the brain is active when person is resting. Yeah, and this is one of the very, very uh, key discovery in systems neuroscience. And if there is a new Nobel Prize in systems neuroscience, we'll probably go to the person, um, Markus Weichel, who discovered default mode network, which is very central to a human brain. Uh, lots of uh, diseases like Alzheimer's, and uh, they have been shown to attack the system the first because this is so important. This is where the memory uh, areas are, the posterior cingulate cortex, middle, middle prefrontal cortex, bilateral inferior part of the lobule, very important parts of the brain. Then, then you have other areas like uh, visual and, and, and auditory cortex here, um, dorsal attention, salience, and so on and so forth. And these, for example, default mode, which is an internally uh, self-generated network. When you are thinking about yourself, you're using a lot of default mode. When you are talking, thinking about things which are outside in the environment, you are using basically a dorsal, net, dorsal attention network. You're attending to things outside uh, or salience network, and they're anti-correlated, as we show here. So, so there are interaction between these large scale networks and these interactions are which makes you let you do lots of things. For example, if I show you uh, this example from GLX in 2012, uh, so when people are young, their brains are very modular and there's a, there is, uh, so this is this blue color is, is one module. Yeah, it could be something, you know, a visual or whatever. So there is less, but, but the thing is, is that the modules have higher, more tighter connectivity within, uh, while they have a sparse connectivity with other modules. Here, when people get old, they require more interaction between these brain networks like this. So they are more integrated so that, uh, so that they can do, they can, they can uh, still afford similar level of cognition they have to do a lot of work, yeah? And that's why, uh, you know, as people get old, they get experience, but at some at the same time, they're using lots of connections. And then at some point, it, it starts to go away. Uh, and when people have to start to get uh, cognitive deficits or dementia, or dementia. Um, so I will now, I don't have uh, that much time left. And, and I deliberately didn't go very fast because a lot of material now will be mathematical uh, from now onwards. Uh, so, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, I, I will try to just quickly introduce you. You don't need to uh, know lots of details there. But what I'm going to show you is, um, is this that the brain connectivity, how different parts of the brain are connected. There are three different types of them. Structural connectivity. So let's say uh, on this cartoon, this is one brain area. There's another brain area. There's another brain area. There are three brain areas and they're connected with each other. This is called structural connectivity. These are uh, presence, of, presence of axonal connections white fiber uh, uh, pathways which are connected to them. They are by definition, uh, they are like roads in a, in a city or in a town. So the road is a physical presence of pathways between, between some, uh, uh, between some um, uh, what you say, places. Yeah, your, your home and your university, there's a, uh, there is a uh, road there and that's what we call a structural connectivity. Um, then you have functional connectivity, and that's where we talk about functional uh, interactions. And this is where we talk about um, uh, we talk about uh, dynamics. So this is basically again three brain regions. We talk about time series, like this is a one brain region, one brain region, one brain region. This is functional MRI where we are measuring the activity in, brain, in the brain and we take the correlation between these three time series and we have these correlations here. By definition, correlations don't have direction. Uh, they are just, you know, uh, directionalness quantities. They are more like uh, 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 traffic on the road. Yeah. So, uh, the, the roads are fixed. The traffic on the road is function of time. 
is dynamic, yeah? Because it could be more traffic in the morning, there may be less traffic uh, in, 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 you know, uh, when people have already gone to home, uh, to, to school or to offices, they're less, uh, you know, um, or if it is very hot, there would be less uh, traffic on the roads, but then in the evening, there will be more. So it's, it's, there's a pattern, yeah? there's a more dynamics, it can, it can vary, right? And this is what happens on top of the structure. Function happens on top of the structure and the structure provide constraints. So you can only go to those places where there's a structure, where there's a road, right? You can't take your car to a place where there are no roads, yeah? Uh, or you can't go far on that. So, so it constrains what can happen in the brain. The structure provides constraints to function. The third thing, this is basically what I do, uh, is, is what we call effective connectivity. So usually these correlations, they, are, they don't have any direction. Uh, but uh, the, how different brain regions work together is important, not only the strength of those connections. So I have these arrows here now. Some of them are, uh, are, uh, are more, uh, they are more thicker, uh, they are some thin, so they show the strength of the connectivity and then arrows show the direction. And this is done by using a framework or, or this is what we call effective connectivity. And uh, uh, this is the causal influence between brain regions. So these are time spaces and we can actually develop a way to infer the direction of the information flow as well as the strength of the connectivity. And, and, and for this, we, we use a method called dynamic causal modeling. Uh, I have to uh, probably go a bit faster now. Um, so I'm just giving you an example here of some simulations. Um, so what we have done is this, that we have uh, three, again, three brain regions and they have some connectivity and it's directional connectivity, yeah? Uh, all three brain regions have these time series. We can change the connectivity uh, or the strengths of these, uh, these, these links, and we can use these uh, time series, or we can simulate these time series by changing these connectivity strengths. And then we can use these time series to calculate the, the correlations. So let's say the correlation here is plus 0 0.7, 9.7, 0 0.49. But I can keep the same thing here, but only what I do is this, I, I change the strength of these signaling or, and also change the color uh, or the sign of them. So here plus means excitatory connection between neural populations. So this is not one neural population, second and third. There are some are excitatory connections, some are inhibitory connections. And although the structure remains the same, what you get is this, that instead of getting a 0.79 correlation, you get only 0.18. I can change a bit more here and I can convert this positive correlation into a negative correlation. I can have a uh, certain signaling here or strengths here and the EI balance here, excitatory inhibitory balance, I can change it such a way that there's no correlation. So they seem like independent of each other, all three brain regions. So what I'm trying to say here is this, that this is a, a mathematically, this is called an ill post problem where you have many, uh, you have same structure, but it can give rise to very different sort of observations. So these are the causes and these are the consequences. Um, mathematically, as I said, this is called an ill post Dr. problem. Adil, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sir, we are... Uh... We're going towards the end of this. Uh, so please conclude your talk so we can have yeah. a question answer as well. Yeah, I will be kind of finishing in a couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So um, uh, I probably may maybe just give this slide and finish. Uh, maybe another slide, maybe a couple of slides, and then I'll finish. So what I'm trying to show here is this, that mathematically this problem is called uh, l pose problem, and we can solve uh, this connectivity reconstruction problem. So that we have connectivity in the brain. This is what's happening in the brain, and this is what we are measuring with functional MRI. So these are the observations, and these are the causes. So this is what we have, and we want to find out what's happening in the brain in the real world. Okay, so this I can show as a, uh, as a, as a graphic. 
So this is brain, which I'm modeling as a first order, first order differential equation, where x is a state of a brain, x dot mean is a first order differential, f is some function f, uh, which is uh, which is a function of uh, some current state x, some input u. So this is like a uh, input or the stimulus that enters the brain, and then there is a connectivity theta. So how different parts of the brain are connected with, with each other, defined by theta. Yeah, and these this is what we want to infer. And then, uh, so something comes in, this is input to the brain. Brain works as a sort of a, you know, uh, a filter here or a dynamical system. It gives some output. And this is what we measure with a MRI scanner. This is, this is a time series. And from this, we can calculate some statistics uh, like a, a functional connectivity or, or, or of course, or correlation, um, what we say here. So these are the causes which are causing some consequences. And from this, we can, uh, what we try to do with dynamic causal modeling is to use these time series to infer what's happening inside the brain. And this is the process of Bayesian model inversion. And from this, we can, from functional connectivity or from the consequences, we try to infer the causes. Um, that's probably uh, uh, this is how far I would go. Um, uh, I do have um, uh, another uh, section, but probably for another time, I I, uh, I don't think that I have time to go through free energy principle. So I just wanted to, uh, uh, as a conclusion, um, I just wanted to. This quote. Uh, I just want to say that I've just wanted to introduce um, what is computational neurosciences. Um, and how we can use this. Uh, one example probably I want to show when I was doing this uh, very complicated mathematics, uh, one could be asking that why we need all of that, why it's useful. So just a quick one minute um, example here. This is an experiment. I don't see so this quite a bit of quite a few of you who are uh, chemists and they know psychedelics, right? So these are mind altering drugs. So these one once you give them like an LSD, uh, you can one can have one once you give this drug, people can have um, subjective experiences like hallucination. They may have ego dissolution. They have these uh, you know extraordinary sort of subjective effects. So uh, so this is where uh, we wanted to understand that when people are hallucinating, what's happening inside the brain. So, uh, and for this, uh, we have uh, made a discovery that there's a part of a brain called thalamus, which acts as a filter and psychedelic drugs like magic mushroom or an LSD, they go in the brain, they work in the, uh, uh, they, they basically open thalamus, which acts as a filter. It doesn't let a lot of information to go to the cortex, uh, but under psychedelics, lots of information go to the cortex and this results in hallucinations. So this is, uh, I just want to give you as an application of the methods that I was showing you, how the hallucinations in a human brain happen. And this is basically, uh, we did uh, with our collaborators in Switzerland, some of the work and uh, we are doing some experiments now with psychedelics in Australia in my, in my lab is doing these and they are uh, the first time that we are giving a uh, psilocybin, which is another sort of a um, psychedelic to, to help the humans. It's first time it's happening in Australia. We are very excited about those experiments. Anyway, so I will conclude with this, that brain connectivity can be used to understand altered states of consciousness, just like I'm showing here, understanding what happens when people hallucinate. Thalamus is opening the filter and lots of information go to the cortex and that results in hallucination. Okay, so um, with that, I would like to thank you uh, and uh, lots of people I have worked over years and lots of uh, sponsors like Welcome Trust and Henrik NHMRC, Australian Research Council, so on. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so thank you, thanks a lot. I I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Adil, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we're really sorry that we have to uh, cut you in between uh, the presentation. Uh, no problem. I expected. I, I did it. I had lots of slides, so I didn't want to myself. I I went very slowly because. But uh, we will. Yeah, yeah. But we'll request you to share uh, the presentation. We can share it with the participants, and uh, in our upcoming uh, events, we can also invite you again uh, with the same talk. 
Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, um, I've, so I have already emailed it to Hasib. Uh, so you will have the talk, uh, and I will uh, in the next talks. Uh, uh, now, once we have a bit more introduction to what I do uh, in future, you can go in more in detail. Sure, sir. So uh, we'll ask the participants. Do they have any questions? If anyone wants to ask a question, he can either type in the chat box or turn on his mic. So there's one question here from Asima Jamil, how to detect and resolve mental disorders like dementia through deep learning or machine learning. Yeah, so um, um, yeah, so this is a good question, very practical. Uh, so uh, what I was showing you the MRI images, so we use uh, MRI images of dementia. So for example, if you are interested in a, a specific form of dementia called Alzheimer's disease, for example. So there is a lot of, these days what's happening is this, that there's a lot of open access data sets of dementia or, or many other disorders. For example, uh, for, as I was saying, Alzheimer's, there's a a consortium called Alzheimer's Disease Network of uh, something. This is called ADNI, A-D-N-I. I will, I will type it here. Um, so this, uh, this ADNI has a lot of MRI images. And then you can use, uh, you can use this, uh, these MRI images to train your uh, neural networks to classify uh, the progression of disease. There's a, um, I, uh, maybe at some other time I could, uh, talk about this, but you can you can uh, search uh, Edney and Tetpool. So Tetpool is a is a uh, global competition where people are trying to predict the progression of Alzheimer's disease using MRI images and coming up with uh, various different new uh, uh, network configurations for classification of disease. This is called Tetpool. Just search on, on uh, uh, ADNI and TEDPO, you will get to see quite a lot of, uh, there's a lot of happening things happening. We do similar work, like we have been working with epilepsy, one of my students, who is actually a master's student at ITU, Information Technology University. She's doing, for example, she's predicting uh, uh, epilepsy, epileptic seizures. So we do uh, some applied machine learning as well in our lab, uh, but we usually do more basic research, so something that I was showing you. Uh, but they, it's very, uh, you know, using deep learning to classify different diseases is very, very uh, topical these days. And there's a lot of material. If you send me an email and you have a specific interest in certain disease, I can send you some resources. And we are doing some work in this area as well. So we have another question from Dr. Faisal. Uh, uh, Dr. Faisal, uh, can we use AI for detection of cancer like brain cancer? Of course, there's a huge amount of work. Uh, for example, uh, there's a very, very good scientist uh, from Pakistan. He is based in uh, in Warwick. His name is Nasser Rajput. So his, uh, I don't do cancer. Uh, but he does, but he does a more of a oral cancer. Uh, so if you look at look at uh, Nas's work, uh, he does amazing work uh, to use AI for classification and detection of cancer in oncology, uh, mostly uh, in in oral cancer. But uh, you know, uh, you can do breast cancer and all sorts of different cancers. Yeah, you can use AI for detection of cancer uh, based kind of cancers. So if you search with name Nasir Rajput, you will see uh, very, very good work from him. So any other question from the participants? Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, I think I've already uh, over time. Um, oh. I'm happy to take another question if, if there's a quick one. So I, I was uh, wondering, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay, I'm Obeshir Beg. Uh, I work in a university called FAS, Lahore campus. So I was wondering, uh, uh, you, you talked about human brain a lot. But do uh, mm -hmm. you study uh, brains of animals or mosquitoes? Because they do exhibit a lot of intelligent behavior 
with a very little brain, uh, perhaps yeah. much less wiring uh, than what we just talked about. Exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I had only hour and I was only talking about very few things. Uh, yeah, excellent question. Uh, why, why go into complex human brains? Why not we can just uh, look at mosquitoes uh, or fly fruits or, you know, uh, Okay, uh, I'm unmuted now. I think you can hear me. So yes, we can use mosquito brains or we can use all different sort of brains. Lots of people do that. Uh, my lab don't do work. We, we don't do preclinical or, or animal imaging, but uh, we have colleagues who work with, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in animal imaging. Um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, in a sense, uh, it, it's very useful to see, you know, uh, they are, so human brains are, of course, we are interested in them because they can do lots of, uh, they are different from, uh, from other brains, like food tribe brain or mosquito brain, because humans can achieve quite a lot. So that's why it's very interesting. Uh, but one can uh, look at, uh, you know, uh, animal brains and uh, try to understand certain mechanisms, uh, uh, which can be used for consciousness. I don't, you know, uh, so we, my lab don't do uh, animal research, but that's a very uh, big area uh, in, 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 uh, in neuroscience, looking into simpler systems, not as complex as human brain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, I will send my slides and if you have any questions, feel free to send an email to me and I will be happy to respond. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Good evening. Uh, now we'll move on uh, to our next presentation by Professor Dr. Mohammed Shafiq. Uh, he'll be talking about the efficient deep learning for healthcare and bioinformatics. So uh, over to you, Dr. Shafiq. Thanks. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir, we can. In the full animation mode? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so welcome everyone. So uh, my talk would be slightly different from all the preceding talks. Um, I'm going to basically um, present you a short overview of um, uh, our ongoing work on the system level design of machine learning or AI for healthcare and bioinformatics. Um, I'm a professor at New York University and I also hold a group at uh, Technical University of Vienna. And um, quite a lot of work that you will see here is basically done by my students uh, who are still at the um, uh, Technical University of Vienna. So, um, um, so I mean, I think this is this is very clear now that we are not talking about any artificial boom of AI. You know, this is a real uh, paradigm shift that we are facing. And um, if you really look at this, that how important it could be for any nation to take. Um, uh, precedence or, or leadership in AI. I have prepared this uh, small pitch. You know, if you really look at the history of mankind, um, the tribes who were having the highest number of people, uh, strongest people uh, with the strongest skill set, they were ruling the world. Then we have seen the age of resources and industry. I mean, there are nations having the highest number or largest uh, natural resources, uh, the most high tech industrial. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, mindset and technology, uh, and uh, as well as, you know, playing with economic politics, basically rule the world. And we are still uh, kind of, you know, are going through those kind of, um, uh, you know. Um, but now what we are also facing or, or, or kind of, you know, going through is, um, is a kind of a paradigm shift where the, there is a new age of data in AI. So data is the new fuel. And you might have already noticed that the largest or the most richest organization are the one which hold the uh, most of the data you know that we are producing and you can see the google and facebook they are primarily the data science or the data companies so data is the new fuel innovation the technology the new politics and there is a nationwide race in dominance in ai so you can find uh, national level uh, uh, statements by all the top countries uh, to gain dominance in ai and and proliferation of ai and in particularly machine learning in various uh, fields of life, uh, you know, ranging from social sciences to all the way up to um, uh, high tech, high end computing and medical sciences and uh, towards the emerging era of cyber physical systems. 
just to give you a bit of overview of you know how broad we are talking about this is primarily i i, I kind of summarize that every possible field of life you know that we are having um, you will see some form of intelligence coming and emerging and basically pervasive um, and interacting in our societal you know norms uh, you can see for example the smart traffic control smart automobiles smart transportation systems there is already a lot of this kind of stuff is there there is a huge progress in robotics industry 4.0 smart houses but in particularly you will see smart healthcare you know so you you are you are already envisioning or let's say going through um, or facing the devices which you can put on your wrist or your ankles or your own head like smart caps and smart shirts uh, which monitor your statistics and then give you some kind of you know feedback about your health uh, can give you some guidance in order to um, you know um, uh, for example, improve your uh, health and, and rec do some kind of recommendations. So there is a there is a wide range of stuff that you will be seeing, and you will also see some kind of uh, crossovers of these kind of technologies. You know where you will see in a smart home how the smart healthcare, for example, would be interacting, how the robotics would come in in surgeries, uh, which would be completely autonomous and learning over the period of time. Uh, there is already some kind of working prototypes in this kind of thing. So these devices generate a huge amount of data. And how to efficiently infer from that data, AI and machine learning are the toolboxes for deriving those kind of pieces of knowledge, um, unknown pieces of knowledge, finding new pieces of knowledge, and deriving predictions uh, that can help um, basically our, um, our our lifestyle and our, the way that we interact and live in, in real world. So there are broadly I can categorize. I mean, like Adil, for example, already talked about the understanding of a brain and how the new neuroscience kind of models can be derived, how we can build a better understanding of brain that can help us in, for example, combating different diseases and understanding the causes may be better. In general, what um, from the systems level perspective that, that we are working on, um, you can broadly categorize into two major areas. One is clinical AI, another is a wearable AI. So um, a classical example of cl clinical AI that you can find is, uh, for example, um, you know, there have been studies where people are looking into taking images in pathology, um, doing cancer detection, and then there is a manual labeling of those kind of stuff, then generating a lot of data and then feeding it to um, train certain deep neural networks. And then um, in the real world applications, then you are giving the real world, for example, samples and then um, identify tumor either in early phases or, um, or in later phases. There is also in radiology where people are taking a lot of, you know, this uh, brain shots like through um, MRIs and then doing segmentations and then you can identify the, um, the complete layers of, for example, edemia or tumorous region um, such that you can um, uh, perfectly or near perfectly remove these kind of tumors. Uh, guide the doctors with these kind of you know detections and then to avoid the minimal relapse or completely avoid the relapse of these kind of tumors. Another very interesting thing uh, that we have been noticing is now is or recently the news, the 50 years old problem of protein folding has been uh, remarkably uh, reported now, you know, and I think this is the Google's um, uh, alpha fold two model, which provides a very high accuracy compared to all the preceding protein folding kind of stuff. And they claim that now we have maybe a better understanding of a protein uh, structure in our body. The area where I heavily work on is variables. Um, uh, since I belong from the medicine background, uh, this is a great area where you put uh, small embedded devices or cyber physical system kind of devices um, on a human body or clothes or you know those kind of uh, any kind, any form of variable stuff to do uh, some kind of uh, monitoring, active monitoring, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, do predictions, exchange this data with the hospitals, and then try to identify the health status, um, um, you know, also give the feedbacks to the, um, to the users that, you know, how good is their health, and then if they need to go to doctor or not, um, and, and, and if they need to adapt their uh, lifestyle, if they need to adapt their medications and, and things like that. And there is also remarkable progress uh, in these kind of devices. Of course, these kind of devices have a lot of other challenges in terms of resources and energy efficiency. So they, for example, are much more constrained in terms of the processing that you can do and the type of neural networks that you can deploy there. Well, on the other side for segmentations and, and all this pathology, you can really deploy or learn um, very, very large scale uh, deep learning models or other form of uh, machine learning models. 
this is not the only case there is a huge amount of other applications like drug discovery personalized medicine smart health record records outbreak predictions and health assistance and you might have also seen there is a lot of studies going on for covid predictions and uh, you know and future avoidance for example using machine learning uh, how big is the market that we are talking about this is really rapidly exponentially growing you can you can see that according to this prediction uh, it would be close to 30 billion dollar in 2025 and there is a large annual growth uh, that we are talking about like 40% pretty much every year and it might actually even um, go super linear um, uh, if we if you really talk about robotics you know and uh, and uh, and there is a lot of robotic assisted surgery and different new use cases which are arising uh, healthcare assistance diagnostic systems and as well as in cyber security also um, just to tell you what is the research impact of or let's see implication of this this kind of uh, paradigm shift uh, there are um, number of publications worldwide has been uh, massively increasing uh, both in healthcare and bioinformatics and you can see is that at the break even of um, 20 or let's say this this inflection point what i call is 2017 where after that went of deep learning there's a huge number of papers which are uh, coming into and and we are talking about really the top journals like nature science cell you know all those kind of stuff you will see there's a large number of ai related publications which are coming also so ai in general i would say that or in particular i would say that machine learning is currently the state of the art in addressing healthcare bioinformatic research problems due to the advent of deep learning so here i would like to precisely correct that you know we are not really talking about true ai here it is majorly or mainly the machine learning community which is uh, basically um, contributing the most of it um, research challenges that uh, that lie in terms of system level design and implementation uh, which we are also focusing on can be categorized in three major areas one is the large data sets um, other is the computing resources uh, problem and the third one is the reliability and security kind of stuff that i will uh, kind of shortly highlight now the large data set problem is very important if you look at the traditional um, computer vision related problem that we have been experiencing there's a lot of work going in camera based systems uh, the state of the art for example is imagenet which is 14 million images with more than 21000 categories but if you look at the largest mri data set osis3 then you will see it's only 20000 sessions two pictures per session and it, uh, for 1100 patients this is definitely too few in order to derive a more generalizable ai kind of algorithm that you can deploy in the real world field um, besides this in uh, in medical data you have other kind of problems like you know the tumor for example uh, that for one patient is at one location may not be at the same location for the other patient though the type might be very similar the behavior might uh, change based on the disease variability and this kind of uncertainty again uh, leads to a low accuracy in the final neural network implementation or result of that uh, and again the data quality considering different types of machines different models of machines different assistants you're working with the machines all those kind of stuff also is uh, there uh, so in, in short, there is a lot of work which is required on uh, robustifying and collecting and building of the larger data sets, which still a lot of community is working on um, on that at the moment. Other thing is the computing resources. When we talk about um, really um, this uh, clinical AI at, at low end, uh, you know, systems, uh, as well as edge AI kind of, you know, applications where we are talking about variables as one particular case, but robotics is another particular case. Um, the You cannot really deploy complex DNN models just because you have very limited number of compute resources. I just give you an example. You may not be able to put a multi GPU system on the head of a robot, for example, you know, uh, or for example, on your watch, which requires uh, a massive coolant or maybe water cooling based systems and things like that. So you definitely need to look into uh, how to optimize these kind of systems. Uh, there is a lot of work going on neural architectural search, uh, hardware-aware neural architecture search, where people are looking into how they can introduce the hardware-aware constraints um, into the uh, deep learning design process and as well as their optimization process. And in particular, when you're putting about the edge, for example, you have multiple of these kind of intelligent sensors deployed um, on a human body, then you know they should, for example, be ultra low power. They should maybe even harvesting their power own uh, in the so-called self-powered devices model. You know things like that. Another thing is really the robustness and the security issue, and this is really a massive issue. If you look at this, people have shown that they can identify the patient by just looking at the data, and 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 this is the reason is that because when you are training a machine learning model, you are primarily 
uh, encoding the data inside the model parameters and you can revert back and you can learn a lot from there but there are a lot of other kind of cyber security issues and privacy issues which challenge the large scale deployment of machine learning in real world uh, healthcare systems you know if you don't care about security then of course you can do whatever you want but eventually you will see that there are serious um, implications of that data collection annotation like people can poison the data people can you know uh, do some kind of privacy breaching into hack your data you know they can do label misspecification kind of stuff when you are training your model um, the and, and specifically if you are training a model on a using a third party resources like clouds and stuff then there could be some uh, model poisoning happening uh, using backdoors for example inside your machine learning model which can do misclassification or uh, uh, and things like that there could be incomplete in, in proper training there could be model stealing and model is a great for example uh, ip and if someone steals your ip then you know basically you lose the business uh, there is a lot of work going on privacy preserving machine learning uh, combining encryption together with the machine learning which are great areas for um, healthcare related products um, deployment and testing is of course another area because there could be a large scale distribution shift whatever training data set you obtained it might happen the real world data set is completely drifted from that which leads to significant um, quality loss of the of the end system uh, there could be data misinterpretation and there could be real world and serial machine learning attacks which basically mean that i can actually attack at the input of your sensor um, without looking into your machine learning model and i can lead uh, to misclassification and this could primarily really destroy the functioning of your uh, ai system in the healthcare domain um, the data set problem is primarily handled by large organizations uh, medical scientists and things like this uh, in particular in the next talk in the next pieces of talk i will go uh, a bit deeper into the computing resources and robustness related challenges um so ai already is from my point of view i mean if you look at the most complex models this is out of the game from any normal user uh, you can look at the transformers for example and people moving way forward towards the sparse transformers and, and gnns very large scale gnns just to give you an idea training a transformer without a nas nas is a neural architecture search which automatically uh, finds the um, near optimal configuration of a deep learning model if you don't do a nas and only do hyperparameter tuning and those kind of stuff transformer requires 84 hours and we are talking about specialized for example tensor processing unit like google chips you know doing this kind of stuff but if you use the nas you know which can give you a very good um transformer model with providing you high accuracy then this requires about like 270k hours with almost 3000 times more energy and who can who can feed the beast of your training things you know you need dedicated power grids for doing that and i'll show you a couple of examples of this also just to give you an idea uh, megatron was the latest nlp kind of model uh, which requires which had 8.3 billion parameters required 512 100 gpus if you look at one dgx1 for example machine which has um, like i think about 8 v100 and dgx2 has like 16 100 these things are like more than 100k dollars and now you have of course a100 which again is pretty much in the same range um, uh, who will buy these kind of stuff you know this is a massive investment feeding them requires uh, tens to hundreds of kilowatts of power again massive investment in terms of the power delivery um, if you look at the uh, latest uh, transformer model this is 90000 times com more complex than resnet now you can say we are not talking about nlp rather ai but if you really look at the recent applications of megatron they are beyond nlp people are talking about applying these kind of transformer models to the healthcare industry and when we talk about the law uh, like really the um, time series kind of you know predictions um, identifying the temporal correlations of different uh, you know vital signs and signatures uh, you know these transfer models can also be very very useful in those kind of cases um what we are currently i mean i just give you a little bit pitch about what we have recently done um, is basically we developed um, um, an open source innovative um, uh, nas uh, optimization framework for healthcare um, uh, applications and specifically the variables one where you have tight constraints in terms of energy and compute we get the user requirements we get the hardware constraints for example you would like to process your uh, deep learning engine on for example jetson nano jetson xavier like small very small embedded gpus uh, we have constructed the data sets from various different online data sets um, then what we do is that we develop a nas framework to automatically generate the dnns 
uh, we deploy um, genetic algorithm based exploration of uh, various different deep learning configurations and then at then we do a model compression which can reduce the um, uh, eventual memory footprint of the um, of the deep learning model just to give you an idea without going into the details of the technical stuff we can get 53x reduction in the hardware overhead compared to a uh, original network design. The network design, we just took the state of the art uh, based on the configuration of, uh, you know, this nature paper. Uh, this, these are the general layer structures, uh, but this is not the neural network structure. So all the configuration is found automatically through the evolutionary algorithms. Uh, how good we are in order to identify, I just want to uh, show you that where the state of the art lies. Um, you can see that um, there are two state of the art networks. One is MNAS net, you know, which is basically for mobile kind of device and that is mobile net kind of stuff. You can see that they are below the, um, the, the really good solutions which are at the top and they are really, really below um, the, um, the, the reasonable or acceptable solutions that you can see. So these networks, you know, are really not effective for the biosignal processing like application. They are customized, more customized towards the uh, camera based or let's, you know, regular computer vision applications. Um, the what we have done, we have basically developed um, a wheel relay search, um, uh, and we do the ventricular anomaly classification kind of problem. Uh, develop different DNNs. You can see on the left side, for example, this is an accuracy only kind of, uh, for example, solution. You can see that there's a lot of solutions that we can get with the top accuracy close to very 100%. You can see, um, and then there is a joint search that you can find in the B case, for example, where we consider jointly the memory footprint and also the um, accuracy and you can see there are still a lot of points that you can find uh, configurations that you can find in the, which were the best uh, of both worlds. Um, a very quick um, uh, result that I want to give you is that, um, uh, is this, uh, I, you know, these are the two, uh, two important results that we have generated using the hardware constraint and accuracy constraint uh, search. Um, I just want to explain first graph, for example, to you. Alpha basically means we are only considering accuracy and beta basically means that we only consider the hardware and then there is a mixture of both. And then we do the pruning and quantization. These are the two traditional techniques to do the network compression. You can see is that when we do um, jointly the memory and the, um, the quality, the compression is much more effective on that compared to when you only develop a solution based on the accuracy. And the reason is that because we basically identify a different um, configuration by walking through a different um, optimization path. Um, so this is an, anyway just the summary of this result, simultaneous accuracy and hardware optimization yields DNNs with better um, ROC uh, as opposed to the uh, optimization solely. So ROC is this result, you know, where you have true positive rate on the uh, vertical axis and false positive on the uh, lower axis and then you know the top left corner is the best one and then the area under the curve that you can for example calculate to identify the efficiency of the solution. Um, having said that we also developed another cloud edge hybrid framework which is called EMAP. Um, what we do is that we basically do the signal acquisition through um, EEG signal uh, sampling devices. This is just like a, you know a cap which has uh, electrodes. Um, then we build uh, a mega database uh, by considering all the open source available EEG data sets. Um, we perform data, data cleaning and pre-processing to fit them to the same uh, uh, syntax and semantics. Um, and then this mega data set is generated with uh, quite some metadata information. Uh, then we have um, a server-based cloud, cloud uh, <coughs> setting uh, where we do, uh, for example, pass this MDB. Uh, we store this MDB there. We pass the online signal there. And then there is a signal search happening. What we do is that we basically match your actual user's EEG signal to the top 100 matches in the mega database so that you uh, know that um, which kind of statistics you would be lying or which class you would be lying effectively. Then we send this top 100 signals to the edge. And the main reason is that we want to preserve the privacy. So these, 100, these, uh, these signals that the EEG device is sending you is not the complete signal. So you cannot uh, reconstruct the complete uh, information of any user's health. Um, then we do much more um, detailed processing uh, at the uh, edge device, for example, using curve-based signal tracking. So we are now basically extending uh, these edge tracking and cloud search with much more uh, advanced machine learning algorithms. This is just an overview of the framework. 
Um, to give you an idea where the machine learning community in terms of computing resources is going, you see that all the training of these complex models is done in supercomputers. On top, you can see a Google Tensor Processing Unit V3-based supercomputer, uh, which are dedicated chips designed for training. On the bottom, you can see the, the V100-based uh, Selene supercomputer. This takes like about 1.1 megawatt of power. The upper one takes like 288 kilowatt of powers. So this is definitely really a massive amount of investments that we are talking about. Um, and then there is recently Cerebrus, which has produced the world's first wafer scale chip, which means one chip is one wafer. And you can see on the left side, this is the largest GPU in the black. And the, in the, on the left side, there is a Cerebrus version one. Now there is a version two also uh, that you can find, which has like double the amount of the AI cores compared to the previous generation. This requires like about 20 kilowatts. So this overcomes the power um, issues that we are talking about. This is also used for training. Um, but what, what is the problem? The problem is that when we talk about really achieving a true brain's efficiency, um, the brain works at close to 20 watts. So, and, and you cannot say that now today's compute model can compete with brains in terms of playing some games or some other stuff. You know, if you want to do, you want to do the apple to apple comparison, which means that you should beat a, a, a brain, for example, in the 20 watt of budget. Um, and even this is a classical use case that people are talking about. For example, if you want to build humanoid robots, you know, um, where you will have, you will put, for example, a brain chip inside, which should work pretty much in the budget. We are talking about hundreds to uh, hundred uh, thousands to hundred thousands of uh, efficiency gap, which is very difficult to uh, to bridge. Uh, I think I will skip these kind of slides. This is like a end-to-end -end framework that we have uh, for optimizing the network. There is a lot of different type of uh, optimizations that we perform. So I just quickly skip through that. Uh, just to give you an idea, for example, we have uh, approximate hardwares, uh, which can, for example, introduce certain approximations in the computing without losing the efficiency. We have specialized pruning techniques, which can uh, cut down the memory footprint by 100 of X, for example. Uh, we are building dedicated hardware accelerators like you have seen the tensor processing unit. This is a systolic array. We are building um, also dedicated hardware units for that. We are building the tools in order to map your deep learning engine on these hardwares. We compare our hardware designs uh, with the uh, competitive GPU models. Uh, we are also looking into memory optimizations because when we talk about really large scale machine learning models, they massively um, move the data between your actual main memory versus the computing. And you need to optimize those memory traffics. This requires speci uh, specialized memory layouting of the, I mean, data layouting in the memory, main memory, as well as specialized on-chip buffer designs that you have to do inside your chips also. So we are also um, looking heavily into these kind of stuff. This is like about a team of four to five uh, students, PhD students working and building the memory and the computer arrays. Then uh, we recently have an uh, European Union project uh, together with Philips Healthcare and a lot of other companies. This is called Mure for Medical, where we are going to test our hardware software concepts and, and, and tool flows for a special use case of handheld ultrasound devices. Uh, this is a very small scale ultrasound device that you can buy and then do a regular fetus uh, monitoring at home. Uh, which actually improves the confidence of the mother, uh, ultimately avoiding the anxiety and those kind of things, which the, the, for example, these companies have done some surveys, which can lead to, for example, a lot of early stage miscarriages. So a lightweight, accurate, yet accurate and relaxing uh, monitoring of, you know, the fetus is actually very important uh, for the continuous uh, health monitoring of, uh, of the baby uh, during the development process. Um, so uh, there is a data acquisition problem, there is a 3D reconstruction problem, there is edge processing problem. So we are looking, for example, into statistical machine learning techniques for classification segmentation and anomaly detections, uh, anatomical feature extractions. We have to build the efficient hardware accelerator that can, for example, uh, just you know be embedded in this small device or a small uh, board inside that. Uh, and towards the end of the project, we have to give a proof of concept in form of an that would eventually be either a very small GPU implementation in a real world system or might be a dedicated chip that we have to design. Uh, and then there would be closed loop um, uh, experimental studies that we have to do. I mean, as I said, this is a work done, um, you know, um, together with Philips Healthcare and uh, uh, this is done by my team in Technical University of Vienna. Um, I, towards the end, I want to pitch about two or three very important aspects. One aspect is real, uh, time learning or lifelong learning, you know, um, if we are talking about uh, robots in surgery or if we are talking about, uh, for example, the variables, 
all these systems are subjected to unpredictable runtime scenarios that you can never capture uh, offline during the complete training phase. That's why there are recent uh, initiatives by DARPA, for example, US Defense Research Agency. Uh, this is one of, one of these kind of programs, which is about lifelong learning. Just to summarize that in a few years, much of what we consider AI today won't be considered AI without lifelong learning. So you need systems uh, which can continuously learn from their environment, from the unpredictable scenarios, uh, and effectively giving you a uh, acceptable solution, which is acceptable yet secure and robust. Another uh, important aspect is the security. So if you look at the core of the decision making things in a lot of clinical AI, as well as the uh, variables, which eventually is a cyber physical system, there is a wide range of attacks which can be done by, on the security side and, and can lead to misinterpretation. I just tell you about the classes of these attacks that I give you some of the examples that have been done in the recent studies. One type of attack is adversarial attack, which is done at the real time when your system is deployed. Another type of attack is a backdoor attack, which is done during the training phase when you are doing the training on a third party cloud services. Another attack is a privacy you know, attack uh, where people can steal your data and the model even during deployment as well as during training. Other thing is called neural trojans or hardware trojans that people can insert while you are fabricating a chip. People can also do attacks on your FPGAs using remote power attacks, for example. And then people can also do surgeon attacks in order to steal your IPS and things like this. So there is a wide range of attacks that are done. How good are these algorithms that you are developing? I just want to give you some idea how bad they are, you know, uh, in terms of robustness. This is a paper very, I mean, in, in a top article, you can see that this is um, a benign mole and this is a malignant mole. Uh, they have done two studies. The first study is um, about adding a small adversarial noise in the original image. And then suddenly the same neural network with the same configuration would detect this as a, as a cancer or cancerous or malignant mole, for example. Similarly, if you just rotate this image slightly uh, or do any other kind of a fine transformation, you will see that this mole is again done, uh, detected as a malignant. So you, this shows that how weak these DNN models are and, and, and you need a robust deep learning model. Um, which also means that you need to robustify your data sets because the data sets that you are using is, are not, for example, transformed in a certain sense. But eventually you need better and robust deep learning models. This is a kind of um, uh, adversarial attack done on one of the um, uh, breast cancer detection, you know, mammograms. Um, and you can see that this um, FGSM or PGD or BIM, these are the standard attacks, uh, adversarial attacks that you can, for example, even find in Clever Hans library. Um, and they have shown that if this is not a cancerous image by doing a small adversarial perturbation, which could be even imperceptible, you can, uh, these are the perceptible ones, but you can also do imperceptible noise insertions. And uh, this can lead to, for example, um, uh, cancerous detection, which is fake and which can, for example, um, lead to uh, very wrong identification. Uh, this is an attack which is done by one of my colleagues at New York University in the background attack on the machine learning of X-rays. And you can uh, see that, you know, in this, for example, uh, um, lung um, X-ray, uh, chest X-rays, what they have done is that by doing backdoors inside, they can insert a very unique signature during the training process. And at runtime, for example, they can lead to a misclassification of these kind of things. So towards the closing, um, this is a this is a nice uh, uh, kind of you know landscape that I've put in order to develop uh, secure and robust machine learning for healthcare. So you can go ahead and and, and look into this. Uh, I have already talked a lot of aspects of this. One of the important aspects that I really like and and I am pushing for for forward in my group is this privacy preserving ML. You know you really need to develop techniques which uh, should be secure as well as robust. Um, there is also uh, in recent Nature paper, there is a nice roadmap which was published, which highlights the challenges and issues faced in the complete end-to-end -end system development. Uh, functional requirements, hardware constraints should be accurately captured using the use case specification. Uh, data anonymization is an extremely important aspect, both in clinical as well as in variable. Um, and this requires a lot of research and privacy preserving measures. Uh, data annotation is an extremely important thing. You, a lot of times you just don't have experts or a lot of times you just don't have early prediction data properly labeled. And this is another important aspect. Again, machine learning development uh, is, is, is a great topic. How to validate that this model that you have developed is acceptable and correct. Experts are involved and remember that the experts in, in, in clinics or hospitals have a very different mindsets as computer engineers or electrical engineers. 
then you need a multi site validation which is again another very challenging thing because different sites have different type of expertise different type of people different type of patients different uh, you know geographies the, you know all those kind of stuff is uh, is uh, is affecting your validation uh, another big challenge is the regulatory approvals you know because whenever you talk about health you need to go through a wide uh, you know range of approvals and, and and which is good you know but uh, this also means that uh, we may need new policies new um, approval processes new uh, even scrutinies because we don't want for example a ill designed uh, machine learning ip going into a real world system which could be critical for example uh, clinical integrations user acceptance real world monitoring all these are very very important things so uh, to conclude my talk ai and specifically machine learning has proliferated uh, almost everywhere and this is for a good reason because we have a lot of uh, complex data distributions and uh, complex applications where these kind of techniques and mathematical toolbox can solve the major research challenges that have not been solved earlier to that level of accuracy and plus it also opens new ways or new problems to understand uh, for example how brain works how uh, different parts of brain for example can impact so there is a new compute model for example neuromorphic computing which is um, is evolving based on the understanding of the um, spiking behavior for example or uh, or the asynchronous behavior of the uh, brain functioning uh, required is large data sets efficient computing robustness privacy security in these kind of machine learning stuff we need a holistic approach we need to bring doctors hardware designers machine learning engineers as well as uh, software optimization and and hard and and soft, software engineers all under uh, one roof in order to solve um, these problems uh, build practical systems um, and if you want to bring these practical systems to real world applications in a fast but yet secure and efficient way um so towards this we really need to form new communities that i believe and that's my vision actually eventually um and and that's towards that end of my talk i would like to acknowledge uh, the students who have uh, contributed a lot of these students have contributed to the hardware and software optimization which are the foundations and a few of them now for example especially with bharat he is working on this eu project uh, working massively on this um, healthcare kind of problems thank you very much that's it from my side if you have any questions uh, feel free to ask me now thank you dr safi uh, for a wonderful presentation and uh, now i would request all the participants if you have any questions you can either type your message or you can turn on your mic and ask a question from dr safi there were lot of chats which i could not follow during the talk so if you have any question just unmute and ask me please mr jawad hussain uh, so anyone from the participants so i guess everyone is tired <laughs> we are towards the end of the session anyway but in any case you can feel free to drop me an email um, and uh, i can also share my slides with you so um, yeah sure i'll also go through the whole chat and uh, look at to if any questions relevant i'll just share it with you thanks so uh, we are moving towards the concluding concluding session now so i would request dr wasim to take over the floor uh, for the concluding remarks thank you so much everyone um, haris i think let's uh, invite the comments from the audience as well if you have any comments or you know suggestions or how can we do that better in future or any you know anything with they would like to share their experience probably um was that good guys we have a question from jawad husain my question is why these techniques are not acceptable for medical community it may be uh, for dr shafiq i guess okay which techniques are not acceptable uh, like these uh, pathology detection a lot of technique from these uh, for covid detection like one of my colleague she worked on this asthma detection and now only i am working on this uh, tuberculosis and other uh, such thing but these techniques are not medically accepted like i have developed a system that that can simply take the lung sound and check whether the person is asthmatic or not and what's the severity level and the uh, those published articles in some really good journals but these things are not actually accepted from medical community what's the reason for this thing uh, 
Yeah, I told you actually in my talk, the reason is, uh, there's a lot of reasons for this. I mean, you know, of course, for the research point of view, for a given data set or for a small data set, you're, you might have good results, but you cannot simply generalize them. There's a lot of issues regarding the, um, uh, the uh, generalization of these techniques regarding the, how diverse the blood samples can vary depending upon the sites where they are adopted, depending upon the regulations in a country. Um, and I personally think that uh, it's not like it's a, it's a negative thing. Um, it's just that we need to go much more comprehensive with our exploration. And slowly, slowly, I think these things would get adopted uh, maybe on a regional basis. For example, if you are developing something here based on the samples from Shifa International, I'll just give you an example. Maybe, you know, in, in that hospital, they might deploy your system as a prototype. And over the period of time, they will see that how good is the efficiency. But you cannot say that I develop a system here and I publish a paper even in a nature and then you know someone for example in a US would let's say UCSF will adopt that solution. This is almost impossible. Um, so I personally think that uh, yes we are on a good track but uh, there is a lot of challenges in terms of data in terms of validation approval generalization that have yet to be solved. So if you are working please keep on working that that's my advice to everyone. So uh, my point is not uh, the adoption, it is actually acceptable. Like uh, I have seen some hospitals, they are not very much welcoming towards uh, techniques like this. I'm trying to mindset. approach some hospitals. Yeah. That could just be a mindset because you, you, for example, is a deep learning expert and you know that what uh, you are achieving and how accurate you are achieving, but how probable that a doctor would gain a confidence in that. I personally, so I mean, you know that there is an AI doctor kind of software and those kind of things. So I personally think that this is done because of multiple things. There could be a natural push from a community that could lead to the acceptability of the things. Um, on the other side, it's really a mindset that how confident a doctor would be in your tool. Um, maybe a doctor would still like to, you know, see all the reports and things like this before he can. You see that whenever we talk about people, we are always very careful, you know. And that's one of the reasons. I think we are at the infancy phase from my point of view. This will take quite some time before it gets acceptable. And it also means that we need to educate doctors. And this can only be done when we do the collaborations. For example, uh, you develop a technique together with the doctor, not by just using an open data set, for example. If you are working in a joint project with Shifa International, I'm just giving one example. Eh? So I'm not marketing Shifa. It could be any hospital X, Y, Z. Um, and then, you know, if you have their data, if you do the findings, if the doctor is also research oriented, like a lot of doctors who are professors, they are interested in these kind of techniques, you know. Um, I, I talked to, for example, here hospitals in this EU project, I know that really there are some serious partners. When I was in Vienna, I knew that there are hospitals uh, who are working, for example, deploying machine learning for uh, OCTs, you know, for your eye scanning and stuff. It's really about educating different people and it's preparing their mindset. If this answers your question, Javad, in terms of acceptability. Yes, I got your point. Actually, I'm trying to uh, get some hospital uh, for data collection. And actually, I, I recently have a PhD and my specialty is data uh, from human behaviors. So I'm like well versed in these uh, techniques and uh, these technologies. Uh, the pro problem is I, I'm a lot, a lot of resistance. Like they're not willing to share their ideas. Saying no, you have to go to the ethical committee and to do this thing, and you have to do. This. And like they're not even forwarding me to the med medical community, uh, the ethical uh, community, uh, ethical uh, committee, like to get the things approved and all these things. So I, I was wondering, like we are doing such like work that we think it's quite good. And uh, like it is not acceptable with the people who are actually going to deploy those things and actually going to use the, uh, use that thing. Because I so I am reading let uh, me, let earlier. Me, let me comment on let me comment on the ethics point. I think whatever reservations you are telling me, they are very genuine from hospitals. If you it's just that I think our procedures have to be much more streamlined. We are a very young one young, young nation in this kind of field, you know, and uh, and I think we might be sometimes uh, a bit. Uh, uh, behind the modern uh, modern nations or developed nations in this thing, but I think there's a potential we can take leadership here. But if you look, if you go to uh, US and do a research in terms of health, you need to do a proper training in terms of ethics and all those kind of stuff. Okay, and and without those kind of things, you you cannot even run your research project. 
uh, and and you need you might even need to do sometimes certification for this kind of stuff um, i personally think that you know the your question is much more related to the regulatory bodies uh, and and awareness you know in this particular case but i would not say that your research is not useful it just would need some time for people to get open to that for community to define uh, regulations and stuff fawad you have a question yeah um, well, first of all to flip it was a really nice presentation uh, i myself am uh, graduated uh, as a pharmacist but uh, i have a lot of interest in this machine learning and i have recently completed a project which was based on machine learning uh, but the the thing which i came to know is uh, the uh, the thing you have discussed about the uh, the attacks uh, on the machine learning i didn't get the idea like uh, why people will attack this the machine learning um, uh, algorithms or models or the whole process uh, can you just uh, like explain it to me okay so you see that hackers are always malicious entities we cannot uh, justify their rational that why do they attack anything you know so this could be attack on for example the nation's health infrastructure just give you one idea this could be an attack on individuals in terms of for example you know this is this is used by minister i'm just giving you one example and, and and you know you can destroy his health and things like this so hackers always have malicious intent so in cyber security research people have various different attack models and the whole idea in whenever you want to develop a computing technology you need to make sure this is secure first of all that's a security aspect other is a privacy privacy is about nobody wants to disclose their data because then you can lead to different things for example someone had a minor heart attack or something else and then he was taking part in elections so there is a story you know in, in i don't want to say the names of countries but there is a story which was very famous from where people using the facebook data people using the clinical hospital identify the health status of one of the you know uh, candidates and then you know it affected his election campaign the point is that attackers and hackers can have lot of malicious intents this could be even competitive bodies opposition parties uh, it could be uh, some nation versus nation things like that okay like you know people do for example attacks on the power grid of a nation similarly people can do the attacks on the health infrastructure people can do the attacks on the individual health devices and and things like that does it answer uh, come on yeah um, thank you shafiq but um, uh, can can this issue be solved like if we use a stand alone application which is not connected to the internet or perhaps like uh, uh, designing a database that can be run from a computer which is not connected yeah. to the internet very good question so the the stone age uh, security is isolate everything let's put it like this okay the yeah. modern age security is everything is connected then make it secure uh, yeah. so yes if you isolate everything that's gone but still you are under one risk and that risk is if someone inserts a hardware trojan in your for example wearable let's say you have a band which monitors your health and it is not connected to any internet but it just you know is for your own personal notifications someone can insert trojan inside the chip when the chip was being fabricated that can for example be activated out using an internal counter or a timer so those threats would still exist yeah but okay. i i i think like uh, that kind of uh, uh, attack should be like um, like in my personal guess if a single device is uh, uh, like uh, chipped or whatever you say uh, th 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 those repercussions will be still confined to a single patient yes uh, it's like for example you fabricate 1 million bands you know from using one chip then everyone is susceptible to that okay and you, have, um, um, you never make you never make one system for one patient that's the point okay this and would be uh, very cost Shafiq, effective yes yeah uh, and dr shafiq can we use like uh, the cloud computing in which i guess um, uh, most of the stuff is encrypted is it still safe to use it so very nice cloud has a lot of security threats itself okay but yes okay. if you are doing encryption then it will help of course your um, security in in one sense and that's where i said it's privacy preserving machine learning is primarily combining the crypto 
community together with the machine learning community. For example, you can train the data on encrypted data. You can encrypt the models. So you can definitely secure your models based on encryption principles. Usman, you had the next question, Usman Sattar. Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, Dr. Shafiq. So congratulations on uh, giving this uh, you know, captivating talk. So I'm a, I'm a medical doctor as well as a health informatician. So I have a couple of comments uh, on the whole discussion and uh, especially pointing to the first comment that uh, there's a certain uh, amount of uh, hesitancy from medical community to adopt some of the you know, cutting edge technology. So I think the, the real concern uh, from medical community uh, because I have deployed a number of pro, uh, software programs in the U.S. Uh, healthcare markets, so I know some of their pain points. So what they are really worried about is the is the liability part of thing. You know, uh, as you remember, that's why IBM Watson, you know, uh, didn't go through. Um, and I think that's a main, uh, uh, you know, complaint from the other side. And also, I think if you try to deploy it with the realistic, uh, you know, expectation in mind, and I think triaging. Uh, and aiding decision making could be a number one application of uh, AI and deep learning algorithms rather than acting them or deploying them alone in the medical system. I think that's uh, something we need to look forward to because I have a chief interest in clinical decision support systems. So we have uh, developed uh, over the years uh, automated uh, decision support system that can aid uh, physicians in taking decisions. So I think that's something uh, that uh, AI and deep learning community can take from. Uh, in terms of and, applications. Uh, yeah, let me comment on this. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very, very interesting point that you mentioned. Definitely, I think there right. is a large scale consensus that using them as a recommendation engines or advisors mm -hmm. is definitely a great area because you don't leave the control on these AI techniques. Okay. Other thing, Absolutely. I think one, one aspect Absolutely. that I did not talk about, but you kind of pointed in your first sentence is really this bias issue. Mm -hmm. You know, I did not, I did not highlight mm -hmm. that, but you know that one of the biggest issues with adoption of these things or, or hesitation in this is really the biases. No matter, I mean, it's a medical right. data or using this for judiciary, you know, the bias in the data and you know, those kind of stuff, this is, this makes it very difficult in terms of the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also the overfitting, overfitting of the data is sometimes a problem because it cannot be generalized then. So I think when you, when you have to create some accuracy for the generalizability is always uh, something to look into this as well. So, um, uh, and yeah, so I think this is a fascinating field is still early on. I mean, um, there are a lot of solutions coming to market, even the U S I mean, uh, there are a lot of solutions uh, that come and go into the market, but I think we should focus on the bigger picture. And then I think in the bigger picture, uh, I see a lot of potential of deep learning and AI really seeping into everything. Uh, I mean, I'm developing right now uh, simple process automation solutions for the physicians, you know, where they don't have to enter the some database or check different data points before taking decision. So I think if we, if we can focus our attention to that problem statement, I think we can, we can pull off something real big uh, in this domain while then just training, uh, um, you know, uh, data from uh, chest, uh, chest x-rays and trying to you know, predict the nodule or something like that, which has its importance, but it's, it's not that uh, far reaching in terms of clinical applications. So I think that's something to look into. And security is always, uh, you know, uh, always a hot topic in, in, in the healthcare. Uh, in fact, I'm uh, also trying to get myself certified in uh, for ISC squared uh, healthcare security application. So uh, <laughs> I'm realizing how, how deep it goes. So, you know, really hats off to, to you guys. And I think we should have it more often. I mean, we are a very close-knit community worldwide. And in Pakistan, I can only count uh, a hand of handful of people uh, on my fingertips. So I think uh, we, we need to have this kind of a discussion session uh, even uh, virtually more often than not. So uh, maybe uh, Dr. Wasim Hadar can look into that as well. So he's familiar with my <laughs> interest as well. So uh, yeah, great job. Thanks, Usman. Thank you so much, Usman. Um, for Jawad, I would just like to say you just wait for, I, be, I believe, three to four more years and inshallah things will be there. And a lot of the hospitals will be opening the doors for the guys like you. There is huge funding going on internationally as well as nationally and seen the um, uh, reviewed couple of projects where they are developing these applications and there are the teams which are 
comprising of the medical doctors plus computer scientists plus uh, um, uh, the the basic uh, life sciences researchers. Um, anyways, thank you so much, everyone. I would like to thank uh, Professor Doctor. Yes, I would, yes, I would like to add something to the uh, the question you are addressing to Doctor uh, Mr. Jawad. Yeah. I also encountered similar issues uh, when we were discussing uh, because we are into this field for last you know, two three years and we have been discussing with AI expert, machine learning experts, and even with the uh, MBBS doctors as well. So uh, what we see is that data availability is not the issue. Uh, the ethics concern uh, may be of data sharing and privacy, but the issue, pro actual issue is that the data available in the hospitals is not sorted according to the, the data cases you need for the algorithms actually. Uh, either the MRI scans are not properly tagged. So these are some issues for public sector hospitals. Maybe uh, one of our uh, uh, Speakers here talked about Shifa Hospital. It's a private hospital. They do have uh, proper databases, but the data sets they have are not properly marked. On I just give the example of to name a hospital, but I agree with you that um, yes, this is actually a big issue everywhere. It's not only in Pakistan, it's, it's, it's across the world. The, mm -hmm. the sorting of the data, the labeling of the data is one of the most yeah. you know important things. Another thing I did not talk about is really the, I mean, as I said, bias, but also the noise in the data. There's a lot of noise and discrepancy in the data. So, I mean, I, if you remember my first block about the challenges in data, there was a lot of challenges. And I personally think that building the proper data sets, and when I talk about building the proper data sets, it's not like online or something. It's a data set which is usable by your machine learning toolbox. You know, that's what I meant, actually. Okay. But you are absolutely right. This is a very important concern here. And another thing we encountered is that we need some support policies for researchers and to provide enabling environment for these researchers so they can have access to this uh, available data sets which are properly labeled. So this is what I wanted to add. So over to you, Dr. Vaseem. So we can yeah, move on. Um, to I think we should wrap up. Thank you so much, everyone. Special thanks to uh, Professor Dr. Mohammad Iqbal Chaudhary Saab, the Coordinator General for Comstech, uh, giving us this opportunity and a great team indeed, Haris. We've been connected together for a couple of months. In between, we got so many uncertainties. I got COVID and then my whole family got infected and um, ended up with uh, passing away of the father on on, on 6th. Uh, may God bless him. Please pray for, for him and all other COVID, uh, the people who passed away with, with COVID. And then uh, we had this um, uh, Pakistan Day Parade going around in the city as well. So then we decided to, and, and we got a couple of cases at, uh, at Comstack as well. So for your safety and for all our safety, we decided to go purely on online. Initially, we were going on a hybrid mod where like some of you might have been with us at Comstack and you know, most of you as, as we are uh, now on uh, via on, online. So, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Saurabh, uh, Saurabh Sina, I wrote him uh, he was my teacher at University of Illinois, and uh, for for uh, as a keynote speak, speaker, he accepted that. And thanks to him for providing us uh, his talk. Um, um, another uh, distinguished guest was Dr. Ghazna Khalid, the advisor for health emergencies, and um, she gave a really good talk about the. It, it, I would say that was a good beginner for us. Um, you, you know, introducing the field. And obviously, Dr. Shahid Mahmood Saab, Chairman and CEO of Interactive Group. Um, um, I would like to thank uh, the, the speakers like uh, Dr. Aziz from Stanford Cancer Institute and Dr. Ahmad Raza Shahid from Comsets University, and Dr. Adil Razi, and last but not the least, and with us, um, uh, Professor Dr. Mohammad Shafiq from New York University. So guys, um, that was sort of a beginner and that was sort of a, you know, I would say networking and a brainstorming uh, session. So please stay around, stay connected. Inshallah, there will be more fun coming in. Uh, we decided to have a hands-on training as well for the beginners. Obviously, we have the people from computer science speakers, and we have the people from life sciences as well. Uh, like me, I started uh, with a biology major somewhere in year 2005. And initially, when I started bioinformatics, I knew nothing about bioinformatics, but uh, here I am uh, after spending so many years. So for you, we need to introduce you the new horizons and the new areas, uh, especially for the students. So learn the basics, do some fun, and then obviously try to be in good institutions of the world as we have the examples in front of us, like uh, most of the people 
they they went from pakistan or they went from other uh, countries like us and uh, obviously alhamdulillah they are doing very well in the all uh, well uh, you know established institutes and renowned institutes of the world uh, thank you so much everyone uh, feel free to have uh, send us your comments and suggestions and compliments uh, thank you so much may allah bless you all over thank to you Harish. Uh, before we close the session we have some announcements uh, we have our associate uh, from comstock mr asib uh, can you make the announcements please for the upcoming events and uh, for this event as well um yeah, sure forgot to thank forgot to thank asib as well he did a lot for this and dr riyaz at iccbs so inshallah our next uh, um, um, focal person will be dr riyaz at iccbs for our next event inshallah um thank you dr wasim um for the participants of this workshop um please drop an email um to haris at comstech so we can mark your attendance um as for the second upcoming event on the 31st of march we have another um online international seminar on challenges in healthcare um the link is open at our website comstech.org so you can register for that or you can leave in um an email and we'll send you the registration link for that over to you haris thank you asib uh, and thank you all the organizers including dr wasim and uh, comstec staff who have been supporting uh, for a long time the it department icc vs karachi dr riaz everyone and all the participants who have been here for uh, with us the whole day so thank you everyone hope we see you again on 31st event so uh, our website is open the registration links are open you can or either you can just drop me an email to me and we can share the links so thank you for the whole day you've been with us